I don't know if you've, uh, if you've ever looked at your life and wondered, is this what life is all about? Put your head in the pillow at night and you think, you know, is, is, is this it? Is there more to life? You know, what does God want for my life? And, and you know, we, we, we wonder, we, we, we think, you know, because we get up in the morning, we go to work, we get home in the afternoon, we have something to eat, watch TV and go to bed. Tomorrow morning we get up, we go to work and we get home, we watch TV and hopefully eat something and go to bed. And then over the weekend we play a little bit. Then the weekend is lucky. But Monday morning, Monday morning rolls, rolls over and we start all over again. And we wonder, is this it? Is this what my life is going to look like? And I think every single one of us has that desire on the inside for more. Where we say, surely there's got to be more to life than this. So I want to speak to you for the next couple of minutes, and Lord willing, for the next couple of weeks, we're starting a brand new series on purpose. What is my purpose? Why has God created me? All right? And so we want to spend a little bit of time on that. And let me just say to you, this isn't a religious issue. It's a human issue. Because it doesn't matter whether people are saved or unsaved. They, they grapple with the same question. What is, what is my life about? And you'll find most people start grappling with this question around their sort of late 30s, mid 40s. Because when we start off and when we're at school, we just go with the flow. We just do what everybody else is doing and we're quite happy and we... We just go for it. And then after school, we study, we get into a job or something. And then what happens? Well, then I've got to get through my studies. If, I'm in, if I get involved in a job, I've, I've got to climb the ladder. And, and, and if I start a business, well, then I've got to grow the business. And so we focused. But there comes a time in our lives where we, where we start settling into a routine or a rhythm. And this is kind of, you know, now business is kind of flowing. Money is coming in, hopefully flowing, all right? <laughs> and, and, and your job, you're in a routine and, and so on. And it's when we settle into that routine, into that rhythm, day after day after day after day, that we start asking this very question. Is this what life is all about? Is, is why, why has God created me? Surely there's got to be more to life than this. And we commonly refer to that as a midlife crisis. <laughs> Let me say to you, nothing to do with a midlife crisis, man. It's a purpose crisis. Because we, we, we're not sure what our purpose is. And so let me say to the young people, you get this stuff sorted out now. You start discovering why you here. Yeah, you never have a midlife crisis. I never have. Because I know what, why God has created me. So I had a young lady ask me the other day, about this and about her purpose and so on and, and 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 it got me thinking but then she made this statement she says you know my life started off as an accident my parents never planned me you know as a matter of fact my mother had me when i was in, in high school and so, so she says you know my, my life is an accident and then she asked this she says how can there be a purpose for my life if my life started off an accident and i said to her oh, no no your life is not an accident. Your, your parents may not have planned you, but God certainly planned you. You get accidental parents. Come on. There's <laughs> no doubt about that. It's not like wake up one morning. Hey, by the way, you're a daddy. What? <laughs> but you don't get accidental children. And so I said to her, you matter. You matter to God and you matter to history. And you matter to people. There are people in your life, and there are people coming after you, and you matter. How you live your life now uh, is going to affect the people in your life, and certainly going to affect the people who come after you. And so maybe there's one person here today, it's all you needed to hear, is that your life is not an accident. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, let me say this. 
until you discover what that purpose is, you'll never be fulfilled or satisfied. And you'll try and find it in all kinds of things. You, you'll, find, you'll try and look for it in accomplishments and achievements. It may be in fame or fortune. It may be in pleasure or parties. But you will try and go after these things thinking that it's going to fulfill you. It'll never fulfill you. It'll leave you empty. And you may have temporary fulfillment, temporary satisfaction. When you, when you achieve that thing that you've always wanted to achieve, you have temporary satisfaction. And then after that, I'm empty again. I read how one of the Olympic athletes who won gold was so excited. It was like a dream come true. This was the thing that he'd worked toward. And two days later, two, not two weeks, two days later, he tells that it, he was just empty. It was just, he, he was, is this what it's about? What now? Do I start all over again? Do I, do I work the next four years and get another medal? And, and then what? And that's why you can find really successful people who are still empty, who are still not satisfied, because we weren't created for that. You go and read about King Solomon. I mean, he achieves greatness. There's no doubt about it. And, and, uh, and he's one of the wealthiest people, the wealthiest on the face of the earth. And right at the end of his life, he comes and he says, he basically says, vanity, vanity, empty meaningless. You know, he says, so let me say it again. Until you discover why you were created and you start going after that, you will always be empty. You will always be unsatisfied. And so I guess then the question is, okay, Lena, so what is my purpose? Why was I created? And the good news is that it's not a secret. You see, God makes it very clear to us in Scripture. As a matter of fact, God tells us over and over again why we were created. And, and I'm not going to try and build tension you and try and s string you along. I want to tell you up front why you were created. To glorify God. The purpose for your life and my life is to glorify God. That's the reason. Let me give you a scripture for that quickly. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whatever you do, so whether it's sport, whether it's business, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory. Do it all for God's glory. Isaiah 43 says, they are my own people and I created them. Here it comes. Here's the reason to bring me glory. And so I hate to break it to you today, but you weren't created for yourself. Life is not about you, by the way. It's not, not about me. Life is about Him. And so the main purpose of your life and my life is just to glorify Him. And when we get that, when you realize it doesn't all rev revolve around me, 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 when we get that, man, that's when life starts falling into place and things start making sense. And that's where we can move forward. Now, let me just say to you, glorifying God is expressed in different ways. All right? Not just one way to express it. Different ways. They one or two main ways in Scripture. And the next couple of weeks, I'm going to unpack that and I'm going to give that to you, Lord willing, but uh, uh, there's a number of different ways to, to do that. And let me just clarify something while we're busy, is that God doesn't need your glory. So in other words, God's not running short on glory. He's saying, hey guys, you're going to top me up here. I'm, you know, the glory tank is running a bit low. God doesn't need our glory, by the way. You say, but now then I don't understand. Why do we need to give Him the glory if, if He doesn't really need that? Because you see, the Bible calls him the king of glory. But then why do we have to give him glory? If we don't give him glory, we're going to take the glory. Think about it. That's where you and I walk around saying, look at what I've done. 
Look at what I've accomplished. You know, I, I worked really hard. You know, I've, I've been very disciplined. And, 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 you know, and I've been saving and I've used my finances well and I've used the gifts and talents and, and I've studied and I've done this and I've done that. Listen, the Bible says every good gift comes from our Father in heaven. We've got to, we've got to be clear in our minds where it comes from. And so the gifts and the talents that you and I have come from Him. And so even though you and I have used those, of granted, but it still comes from Him. And so maybe you're saying, you know, my, my, my hard work is busy paying off. Well, who gave you the ability to work hard? You know, my studies have opened doors for me. Granted, who gave you the ability to study, the academic ability? Because God doesn't give it to everybody. God's, got, God's given you that ability. And so we've got to recognize where it comes from. And when we do, it keeps us humble. And it helps us to give God the glory to, to who it belongs. We don't, you see, you and I were never created to take glory. We were created to glorify God. And so I think one of the best things that you and I can do, one of the best habits we can develop in our lives, is just to continually give God the glory, give God the praise. Everything we are, everything we've accomplished, it's all because of Him. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be where I am today. I'm just telling you, God has been good to me. And God has been gracious to me. And so we've got to do that. And the higher we go, the more we've got to glorify Him. Why? Because the higher we go, the easier it is for us to become proud and arrogant. The more success we have, the more we've got to give God glory. And so the more God promotes us, the more God blesses us, the more we've got to give God glory. Because that's the thing that keeps us humble. James 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Do you know that verse appears three times in Scripture? He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. What does that mean? A simple explanation, a simple meaning for that. God is on the side of the humble. God comes on your side. God comes and helps you. But when you and I are a little bit proud and arrogant, you know, I've, I've worked hard and I've done this and I've raised my children well, well, that's a little bit of, of, of pride, a little bit of arrogance. And the Bible says God opposes the proud. Another translation says he sets himself up. So instead of coming alongside of us now and being on our side, now you can almost say he's against us. Not, not us as such, but the pride and the arrogance. God wants nothing to do with that. And the Bible says here in, in Proverbs 16, the Lord detests. He hates. It's a strong word. He detests all the proud of heart. And I think we've seen this. We've seen people who've become a little bit successful, and then they become a little bit arrogant. And that may be success in business, maybe success in sport, maybe, maybe in, in the entertainment industry or something like that. They become successful, and the next moment it goes to their head, and, and they become a little bit arrogant. And then what happens? It's not long. They come crashing down. Why? Because God detests that. God sets himself up against proud and arrogant people. Listen to what it says here in Proverbs 15. It says, For the Lord tears down the proud man's house. Wow. So when things start going wrong with proud and arrogant people, it could just be that God's saying, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you to size. I'm going to bring you back down to earth again. Why is that? God doesn't share His glory. And so when you and I go around thinking, you know, you know I'm so smart, I'm so talented, I've worked so hard, that's the beginning of the end. That's a scare. When I see people like that, 
Man, I get scared for them. Because if you think about it, that was the original sin. Pride. That's the thing that caused Satan to fall. But when we keep a humble attitude and we just recognize that it's a goodness of God that got me here and it's a grace of God that's keeping me here, when we do that, when we, when we have a humble attitude day in and day out, guess what happens? God comes alongside of us and instead of opposing us, instead of God detesting that, He comes alongside and He helps us. He lifts us up. Let me give you scripture for that. In 1 Peter 5 or 6, it says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Another translation, the NIV says, that He may lift you up in due time. And so God lifts the humble. He helps the humble. He comes alongside of the humble. He's on the side of the humble. I don't know about you, but I want God on my side. I don't want God against me. I need God on my side. And so the purpose of our lives is just to stay humble and to give God the glory. Don't take the glory. We'll be tempted to do that right throughout our lives. You make a good decision. You think it was your decision. Meanwhile, it's God helping you. I'll show you in a moment. And so you make a couple of good decisions and you tend to think, you know, you know, look at them. No wonder they are where they are. I made stupid decisions. Look at me. You know, don't go there. Don't go there. That's arrogant. All right. So how do we give God glory? I want to give you just two things today. And the first one is recognize God's hand upon, his, upon your life. We've just spoken about that. Recognize God's hand upon your life. It's gratitude. It's thanksgiving. It's staying humble. That's all it is. All right? Here's number two. Loving God. Loving God. How do we give Him glory? We love Him. We love Him. One day a man came to Jesus and asked Him, you know, what's, what's the greatest commandment? Because they had a lot of commandments. So Jesus, what is the greatest? Without hesitating, Jesus replies, He says, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. You know what Jesus is saying? This is the first purpose of your life. This is the greatest purpose of your life and my life, is to let Him love you and to love Him back. What's that called? Relationship. God's not interested in religion or religious rituals. We think if I do this ritual, if I do that, God's not interested in that really. God's interested in relationship, which is, which is heart. He wants our heart at the end of the day. And so that, that's why this is called the greatest commandment, because that gives us the greatest purpose for our lives. Now, I know it's a difficult concept to try and understand, try and get your head around, especially if you're a guy. Let me tell you how, what happened with me. There was a time where I suddenly started asking myself the question, Leonard, do you really love God? Because we sing about it, and we, we pray, and we say we love Him. But I thought, you know, you can't fool God. He knows your heart. <laughs> Do you really love God? Because, you see, I, I started looking at it, and I started, I realized I don't feel the same as I feel toward my wife, or I feel toward my, my children. Because, you see, here's our problem. We tend to think that love is a feeling. So if you have a good feeling towards somebody, and they make you feel good. <laughs> Guess what happens? Oh, I'm in love. I'm in love. It's so good. <laughs> but guess what happens down the line? And let me and, and most of you have been married for a couple of years. You know exactly what I'm going to say. Those feelings change. And some people don't realize that. You, you and I have experienced it. The feelings change. But for some people, it puts them into a tailspin. And now they think, but, but I don't have the same feelings anymore. It's probably not the right one. And so where do they go and find the right one? Facebook. You know that, that, that boyfriend I used to have? Maybe he was the right one after all. And so they go back there. Or in the gym. 
you know, the one that looks so nice. And when they just smile back at you, oh, I have that feeling again. So now I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave this one. And I'm going to go for that one because the feeling. Feelings are fickle. And feelings come and go. And feelings are deceiving. We cannot base our love upon feeling. Love is not a feeling. It's an act of your will. Where I decide, I'm going to love this girl till death do us part. It's a decision that I've made. And so it's the same with God. If, if love is not a feeling, if it's not based on feeling, then how, how do I love God? And it's very simple and it's very easy. We put God first in our lives. So in other words, we, get, we make Him the center of our lives. If we say we love God, then He's the center of our lives. You see, let me say to you, God didn't put you and me on this earth to live self-centered lives, which is what we do without even thinking about it. But He put us on this earth to live a God-centered life. And so God doesn't just want to be a part of my life. You know, I've got this and that and the next and my sport and my, my business and, and stuff. And then Sunday, you know, He's a part of my life. <laughs> doesn't want to be a part he wants to be the part. God wants to be the most important part of our lives. Well, what does that practically look like? Well, it means that our family is important to us and may be very important to us. It's okay, but God's more important. You've got some dreams and, and some goals. It's good, but God needs to be more important than those. And you've got a business. And you enjoy that business. Because I certainly did when I was. And that's good. No problem with that. God's not threatened by that. As long as He has first place in your life. You see, God wants to have first place in our lives. And so if God is the center of our lives, He's also going to be the focus of our attention. Because there are a lot of stuff busy competing for your attention. If you're studying at the moment, those studies <laughs> are competing for your attention. If you've got a baby at home, I don't even have to tell you. <laughs> All your attention goes there. If you're busy training for some major event or something, sports event, your attention is going there. You've got to make sure that God and not those things, God is the center, is the focus of your attention, because that's what it means to put God first. And if you think about it, you're going to center your life around something. You will. I will. If, if, if we don't know about our purpose and we don't understand this stuff, we're going to center our lives around something. And if you're a mother, I can almost tell you, you'll center it around your children. And if you're a business person, and maybe your business... If you're, if you're a sportsman, maybe you're sport. But you're going to center your life around something. But here's the thing. Anything besides God in the center of your life is an idol. Could even be your children. Could even be your spouse. Or that very business God's blessed you with. But you start putting that in the center. So in other words, you say, Leonard, I've never purposefully done that. But maybe I've done that. I've been focusing on that. And I've been, my whole focus has been on that. And God's just playing a little part. It becomes an idol. And God warns us against that when he gives us the Ten Commandments. The first commandment. The very first one. You shall have no other gods before me. And just because you don't have a little Buddha in your, in your lounge, you think you're cool. <laughs> but that fat little baby is. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> what about the business? 
What about the sport? If something else has your focus more than God, that could be an idol in our lives. And again, hey, today is all I'm doing is I'm we just we've got to realign. We've got to bring things back because we can drift. We can put our focus on things without us even realizing that we're doing that. So how do we know if something else is the center of our lives? It's pretty easy. We start worrying. Worry about your retirement. Worry about your health. Worry about your children. Start worrying. People start worrying, it's, you can see. Because if God is really the center of your life, <laughs> that's where you have a lot of peace. You know what's been amazing through all of this stuff that's happened with SAA? And, and I mean, you know Rick who's lost, uh, he's, a, he's a pilot, for, he used to be a pilot for SAA and he had no income for a long time. But he's had such peace. He's like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God's going to undertake why is that? Because God's the center of his life. When God's the center of your life, that's when you have peace. That's when you have calm. You, you're totally relaxed. Let me give you a scripture here. Philippians 4, 7. Beautiful scripture. Listen to this. A sense of God's wholeness. Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. When, when, when you put God there, then somehow the other things don't matter. He'll undertake. He's, he's going to make a way. And so the most important question for your life and my life is not who will we marry or what career will we pursue is who or what will be the center of our lives? That's, that's the most important question you can, you can ever answer. Now, I know this, this concept of centering our lives around God, for some of you, may feel like, you know, you're going to miss out. You're going to lose out. Because, because, you know, Leonard, I've got some dreams and I've got some plans. I've got some stuff I want to accomplish. And do you want to tell me now I've got to put all of that stuff aside? And, and, and listen, listen, let me just say to you, God doesn't hassle about your dreams and plans. Some of those dreams he may have given you, not all of them. I think some of our dreams and plans are pretty selfish. But there's some of those dreams and plans that God may have put in your heart. God's not threatened by that. And God really doesn't mind if you excel even in sport or so. God does not hassle by that. And, and God God's not, uh, has no problem to bless you, to come alongside in whatever area you, you're involved. God can come along and, and bless you and give you tremendous success, provided, here's a condition, provided you've given Him first place in your life. When we give God first place, all these other things fall into place. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, one of my favorite uh, verses. In everything you do, not in some things, in everything you do, put God first. Now listen to the promise. And He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. There's the promise. God says, I'll direct you. You're about to make a decision. He says, I'll show you. He says, you'll sense on the inside. Now, I don't know if I, should, if I should do this deal. I don't know if I should invest there. I don't know if I should buy this house. God will direct you. And he'll crown your efforts with success. Now, that shows me success is not just going to come by itself. You're still going to have to make an effort. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> but here's the thing. You make an effort, and next moment, you're success. And you put your hand to this, and you make an effort, and you have success. And you think, how come? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. What's the condition? You put God first. That doesn't happen to everybody. If we put God first, he says, I'll direct you and crown your efforts with success. 
So you know what Scripture is basically saying to us? If you get your priorities right, life will work right. You put God first. He'll take care of these other things. That's Proverbs 3. That's Old Testament. And then in, in Matthew 6, Jesus comes and Jesus basically says the same thing, just different words. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. You see, when before you seek your own dream, before you seek your own plan, you come and say, God, what, what do you want for my life? God, what do you want me to do? When you start doing that, what, what does Scripture say? All these other things will be added. And you go and have a look at that Scripture in context. You'll find it's not referring to spiritual blessings. He's not saying, I'm going to give you all these spiritual. You're going to have discernment. And you're going to have. It's referring to material blessings. Go and have a look at that. You'll see. When we put God first, He says, I'll undertake for you. The desires of your heart, the things you need. God says, I'm, I'll undertake for you. So let me wrap this up. You'll find some people work their whole lives to try and find success. If you put, if you put God first, success will find you. You put God first, success will find you. I remember 20 odd years ago when I had a business, I just put God first. And then already as a youngster, I remember praying that prayer. Saying, God, I'll serve you. God, you can do with my life what you want. Crazy prayer to pray. Never knew it would lead to this. But I saw God's blessing upon our business. We did fairly well. And even then already, I gave God the glory. I gave God the honor. Because I knew this is, this. I'm not that smart. I really am not. This must be God. But I was putting God first. And then when my father asked me to join the staff uh, here at Maranatha, I remember praying that prayer. Because I enjoyed business. I really did. And I remember praying and saying, God, I surrender my life. If, you, if this is what you want for my life, I'll do this. But I hope it's not what you want. <laughs> it's exactly what I prayed. I hope it's not what you want. Because this is crazy. Because, you know, God, I can't preach. God, there's not a chance I can stand here and do what my dad did. You know, he would just, he wouldn't preach. He'd just stand talking to the people. And I'd look at him and admire him. Little did I know. But you see, when we put God first, somehow his blessing is upon our lives. Even God's blessing upon this church. When we put God first, God's blessing rests upon us. And so next week, I want to share with you, I, I want to spend a bit of time on this. What does it mean? What does it practically mean to put God first? To make Him the center of our lives? Because if we can get this, I think it sets everything else up in our lives for success and for blessing. And I don't know about you, but I really want God's blessing upon my life. <laughs> I don't want to be battling along if I could have His blessing. Amen? Come on, let's stand. I want to pray for you. Let's bow our heads. Father God, everything we are is because of You. Everything I've got is because of you. And so we just want to come this morning and just acknowledge your goodness and your grace upon our lives. It doesn't mean our lives are perfect. But when we look at what we have and what you've done in, in and through us, God, you've been good to us. 
And we want to give you the glory today. And so easy for us to take the glory. And we've probably most of us have done it in the past. I certainly have. But God, you, it's because of you. And so we want to give you the glory. And I pray now for every single one of us that we're going to learn in the next couple of weeks what it means to put you first. What it means to make you the focus, the center of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.